The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley. With me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest, a member of the Society of St. Pius V, and he is also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. How are you doing? Doing well, Father. Good. Great Good. to be here. Good to see you. Yep. Father, tonight I thought we could get into a topic that uh, we have been saving for quite some time now, and that would, would be Our Lady of Good Success. Uh, we've had multiple viewers write in and, and ask uh, your opinion on this, Father, if you were familiar with Our Lady of Good Success and, and the apparitions that uh, took place in Quito, Ecuador. And um, a, a lot of our, our viewers wanted to get your reaction to this, and we actually had a, a very, very generous viewer, a, a great, great friend of the program, who actually sent us a, uh, a documentary about this, about Our Lady of Good Success. And uh, Father, we, we both, we watched through this documentary and um, done a, a bit of associated research. And uh, so I guess, Father, just, just in general, what is your, um, what is your opinion on, on these uh, apparitions that, that uh, took place um, in, in Ecuador and Quito and uh, just your overall impression of Our Lady of Good Success? <laughs> Well, Tom, you're right. We, we do have supporters of the program who are great uh, devotees of Our Lady of Good Success. And uh, we've been asked by a goodly number of people over the years to do a program about that. And uh, I'm glad they persevered yeah. and waited so patiently uh, because it is truly an approved Catholic apparition uh, with quite a, uh, quite a history of uh, church, uh, not only endorsement, but uh, actually, uh, especially in the 20th century, great devotion. And uh, this apparition uh, is a great explanation of the events of, let's say, the last hundred years or so, and very con comforting to the faithful who have been, who've seen uh, tragedy, disaster, uh, corruption, uh, not only beset the world, but actually attack the church, and not only from without, but also from within. <clears throat> and Our Lady's words in Quito, Ecuador, uh, to Mother Maria of, uh, well, Mother Mariana de Jesus uh, Torres, uh, proved to be a great comfort that uh, they realized that God is completely in charge and uh, nothing that is happening is happening without his consent. Um, or without his, his control. So uh, they, they take great comfort in knowing our Blessed Mother's loving solicitude for souls. And uh, the, the events that have taken place in Quito and then around the world and fulfillment of the prophecies made um, are, are really very astounding, truly astounding. Um, there are those who hesitate over this um, devotion over this, this appar these apparitions and uh, revelations, uh, uh, private revelations, uh, the prophecies, because they say that this was not well known until about a hundred years ago. It started to become known about, well, the 20th century. And many of the prophecies were about the 20th century, actually, uh, in the world and in the church. But uh, actually, it was prophesied uh, as part of the apparitions back in the, well, they took place between 1594 and 1634, so a period of 40 years. And uh, just after the final apparition of 1634, Mother Mariana passed away, actually. Her body remains un incorrupt, though, um, which is a, a great endorsement, you know, from heaven of, of the message that was given here on earth through our Blessed Mother. Um, this is, a, I would say, a classic Catholic a apparition. If you, even if you look at the substance of it, um, the mode of it, uh, you can see that it is Catholic just in its format, 
its heavenly format, you might say. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be anything un-Catholic about it. Now, that doesn't mean that there are not others who try to somehow adulterate uh, or falsify the message because it is so uh, important, because it is so Catholic. But nonetheless, in terms of the actual devotion of the message itself, it seems to be thoroughly Catholic. Uh, we have Americans who are very much involved in, uh, in spreading the message. Uh, Kathy Heckenkamp is a name well known, thoroughly associated with the devotion here in the United States of America. Um, and she's done great work through, uh, uh, you know, her efforts and uh, organization, basically, I guess, to, to spread the, the uh, knowledge and the devotion to Our Lady of Good Success. The, uh, the, there seems to be a certain amount of question about the Spanish title Nuestra Señora de la Buena uh, Suerte or uh, uh, Nuestra Señora de la Buena Suceso. Now, I don't speak Spanish. You can probably tell. Anybody who does can probably tell from what I say there. But uh, nonetheless, um, uh, there are similar, well, similar sounding devotions, okay? But the way it's rendered in English, Our Lady of Good Success, is pretty much the standard way of referring to it, not just Our Lady of the good, Great Event, yeah. the good event. But this, this devotion is tied to this day, this date, February 2nd, this, this mystery that is celebrated, uh, the purification of Our Lady and the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple, the fourth joyful mystery of the rosary. <clears throat> Today is that feast day. We sometimes colloquially call it Candlemas Day, <clears throat> but it really celebrates two events that are intimately tied together. The presentation of the newborn child Jesus in the temple, now 40 days old, where the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph offered the two turtle doves, in a sense, as a sacrifice to ransom him, <coughs> which obviously <coughs> was futile. He was not to be ransomed, whether he, because he was the price of the ransom of all mankind, right? So to <coughs> symbolically ransom him with the, what the law of Moses required, the offering of two turtle doves, uh, is considered by the fathers to have kind of brought to an end that Old Testament prescription. Because here is the Son of God now, sinless, absolutely, uh, divine person, uh, with a, a mortal human life um, here on earth. And uh, so that symbolic ceremony of offering the two turtle doves um, in a sense, met its match. It had been finally fulfilled in being offered for this, the Son of God, who himself was to be the ransom, the price of the ransom of, of the souls of mankind. And, uh, but also even the purification of Our Lady. Here you have a conception, a gestation, and a birth entirely free of any stain of sin. An immaculate conception of her own, and certainly the most immaculate of immaculate conceptions, her conception of our Lord Jesus Christ did not need any purification. And so again, that prescription of the law of Moses, according to the fathers, met its end there. It came there to a kind of uh, amazing, splendid, magnificent fulfillment in the attempt, the outward attempt of a, a purification of the purest of the pure. Uh, and so these two things became obsolete in the very act of this, of this uh, offering of the sacrifice uh, and the purification of Our Lady. The, these days, as I say, um, are very, very special to these apparitions because the apparitions began on February 2nd, 1594, and ended with a concluding apparition on February 2nd in 1634. So it's ironic, I guess, more than ironic, uh, poetic, it's providential that we're actually covering this subject on this very feast day today and at this time in the world's history. Mm -hmm. 
Father, one, one of the, the big questions that we had was, um, you know, this, this devotion is, is relatively unknown. You kind of touched on this, but why why would that happen, Father? All of these years, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned the late 1500s where this began. Why, you know, all of, all of these years has this devotion been so um, sheltered, perhaps, in, in Quito? I guess it's relatively well known, but, but why throughout all, all of Christendom, Christendom, all of the, the Catholic world, why has this devotion not been more widespread? Well, we find in history that uh, our Lord and our Blessed Mother, uh, following our Lord's will, uh, does uh, appear and then tell, tell people to, to wait, to wait for the right moment until they receive instructions. Um, I mean, even our, during our Lord's life, you know, he would heal or he would reveal things, the apostles, and he would say, do not say anything to anyone at this moment, okay? But he told them, uh, to plant in the world these truths. And in time, they were to be made known, but it was not, uh, the time had not arrived. Remember when our Lord uh, was transformed before the apostles, uh, St. Peter, St. Uh, Saint James, and St. John. And as they were coming down the mountain, our Lord said, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Right. And so they had to keep that, keep that silent. And uh, we find that all the way to Fatima as well, where our Blessed Mother revealed secrets to the children, notably Lucia, and told her she could not reveal them until the time came, and she would let her know when the time had, had come. So it wasn't until years later that the first, second secrets were revealed. And uh, the third, well, you know, there's controversy about that. Some are even talking about a fourth secret of Fatima. But in any case... Um, so it's not unusual for our Lord to do things this way. And one might say, well, why would he do this? Or why would Our Lady do this? And I, th I think the answer is already explained by heaven that um, I'm telling you these things by way of prophecy beforehand that you may be known, that you may record them and make it known uh, uh, when the time comes that these prophecies will be understood. Um, there are things that, that could have been, uh, th that were said to apostles, uh, to children at Fatima, and between those two times, many others, who were told, just keep this to yourself for the time being. The time will come when it will be the right moment to reveal this. If, if these things had been revealed uh, to the world when they were revealed to, to uh, let's say, Lucia at Fatima, they would have made no sense. Russia spreading her errors throughout the world. I mean, people would have scratched their heads and said, this is, this is the, the utmost nonsense, you know. And uh, it would have made no sense to them. They would have scoffed at it. Um, but as time went on, things happened in the world that actually brought everything into context. And then people could see, I, oh, yes, yes, of course. And the fact that this was revealed to the children years ago, you know, tells us that this is God's doing, God's prophecy, and also uh, God's knowledge and God's will. Um, in, in the case of Fatima, what Our Lady told the children of Fatima, because of sin, right? Mm -hmm. God's just judgment because of sin. Mm -hmm. So I think when it comes to what Our Lady told Mother Mariana at, at uh, Quito, I mean, what she had to say was uh, rather startling. And at the time, it probably wouldn't have made much sense to, to anyone. I mean, she, she would look at the prophecies that she gave, that, uh, um, that the church would um, be invaded, the church would be says, uh, not only corrupted from within, that uh, priests would lose their way, right? Um, that the church, uh, meaning the, not just the local church there, but the, the cat church with the capital C, the Catholic Church, you know, would uh, be beset by enemies from without and from within. And corruption would invade the church. Um, Our Lady talked about um, uh, Ecuador itself undergoing a great trials and great the church being persecuted terribly by the freemasons i i think she might have mentioned the masons too I think so, yeah. uh, by name that they would persecute the church um, but that just at the height of persecution 
uh, a, a man would be chosen to be the president, it would be a, a Catholic, true Catholic gentleman. Yeah. Uh, it, his name, uh, Gabriel Garcia Moreno. And he would restore the reign of Christ in Ecuador. He would restore peace and prosperity to Ecuador. He would restore the faith to Ecuador. Uh, and uh, he would consecrate Ru the, the Ecuador, Ecuador and its people to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And for that, all of that, he would be assassinated. But his assassination would be a martyrdom as a crown that God would allow him to have uh, for his people. Um, kind of a great victory for him. Uh, in dying, uh, right in the steps of the cathedral, I understand, when he was stabbed to death there, uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Moreno said, I die, but God does not die. Uh, his dying words, actually. And... Um, he died a great hero. There's a great statue of him there to commemorate that event, even in spite of the efforts of the enemies of the church to prevent that. And, uh, you know, when in the, uh, the year 1594 uh, and the next 40 years, this would not have made an awful lot of sense to people in Ecuador, or maybe anyone else in the world. <laughs> um, but it all came to light here. And... Uh, Oh, there were times when the pagan government of, of uh, Quito tried to expel the nuns from the convent. Yeah. And um, the nuns actually at one point were all packed up and ready to go because they were warned that the document to expel them from the convent had been <coughs> signed and was sitting on the president's uh, desk for execution the very next morning. And that very night the government fell. <laughs> that government came to an end. So um, it's just kind of interesting seeing the fulfillment of the prophecies of Our Lady at Quito, how she would protect uh, those sisters. It, it's interesting, the convent itself was dedicated to the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady <clears throat> bef long before, long before the Immaculate Conception was defined as a dogma. In fact, that was one of, the def one of the prophecies of Our Lady at Quito, that the same Pope who would uh, declare the infallibility of the papacy of the Pope would also declare uh, infallibly the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Right. And that took place in the middle of the 1800s, uh, more than 200 years after the final apparition. But Our Lady Prince prophesied these things, you know. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things she prophesied is that the, what she had to say there would not generally become known or be of interest until the 20th century. When she prophesied, the church would come under almost universal attack throughout the entire world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the enemies of the church would uh, run roughshod over her, uh, <clears throat> even uh, invading, invading the church. Mm -hmm. you know? And Father, j just to um, real quickly, or we might say infiltrating the church. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, just to go through some of the the prophecies, though, like, like you mentioned, um, she uh, she she prophesied the the uh, the immaculate conception and the the dogma of the infallibility, uh, papal infallibility. Uh, she also uh, prophesied the, uh, the the fall of the the papal states. Uh, Garcia Moreno, the the president uh, r rising, mm. um, but but she also. You know, and talking about the the twentieth century and, and the things that came to pass there, she she prophesied this you know this great crisis crisis in the church, um, in modest fashions, a loss of innocence. She talked about how the, the sacraments would be profane, and I believe actually went through each of, of the individual sacraments. She's talking about the, actually the, ch the especially the children mm -hmm. losing their innocence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She talked it's about the, the, the the bad priests and even uh, a lack of a, a prelate and father during mm -hmm. during this time, but. Um, one of the uh, the the last prophecies, Father, was was of a of a great restoration, a, a happy restoration, where you know, mm -hmm. essentially her her, in other words, her immaculate heart would would triumph. But mm -hmm. I mean, we see every one of these other prophecies fulfilled mm -hmm. to the letter. Um, so perhaps we can we can place a lot of hope in that. Well, I, I understand uh, that the only prophecy that she gave that has not yet been fulfilled is that triumph yes. of the immaculate heart of Mary. Yes. Yeah. But all of the others have been fulfilled. Yes. So, as you say, we have every confidence that that last <laughs> will, in fact, be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You know, even the uh, the coming of the statue, 
in honor of Our Lady's appearances there. It's very interesting. You, yeah. I'm sure you know a good bit about that, probably yeah. every bit as much as I do right now. Yeah, yeah I, just, I, I wanted to ask about that, Father. I mean, um, this sounds rather, um, if our viewers aren't, aren't familiar with the story, perhaps I'll, I'll let you fill in a lot of the details, but I mean, it's rather um, miraculous um, story behind it. Apparently, Our Lady herself commissioned the statue in, in one of the uh, apparitions that took place during 1599. She uh, she even designed it. She designed it. <laughs> she 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 chose the uh, she chose the sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, she um, but but upon the the um, completion of the statue, there, there's this story of uh, this apparition uh, with the the nine choirs of the angels in the church. The the three archangels um, were there and. St. Francis of Assisi as well, and apparently there, there was this, um, they described it as Our Lady entering into the statue to mm -hmm. kind of completely change the statue and mm -hmm. just make it this this radiant, um, mm -hmm. almost unbelievable, miraculous statue. Um, yeah. that, that's a rather fantastic story. Well, you know, it is. I mean, you call it fantastic, <laughs> and I guess it is. I mean, it's, it's really... It's really striking. Yeah. Uh, so much so that, you know, you really have to ponder that for a yes. minute. But, uh, you know, the, the, the account is that Our Lady herself, uh, in a sense, entered into the yeah. statue yeah. and sang the Magnificat for yes. the statue, yeah. right? Yeah. But, uh, that, I mean, we actually have the testimony of the sculptor himself, right? <clears throat> Saying, what you see here is not my yes. work. <laughs> yes. is that it is the work of heaven. My, my work was superseded by the work of heaven. Yeah. And uh, so he, he did not take credit for the appearance of the statue. He said, this was not my work, because it was just so radiant. And um, there's even, a, a, you know, an account about the Christ child whom Our Lady is holding is not of the same quality as the statue of Our Lady. It, it, it looks somewhat crude in comparison. And uh, <clears throat> so there are people who question that. Why would that be so? On the one hand, Our Lady is holding a crozier because the bishop, um, when he came to, you know, consecrate the uh, the convent and the, I guess the statue, I don't know if he did it at the same time, but anyway, he actually placed the crozier, his crozier in her hand and asked her to rule not only the people, the, the sisters in the convent, that she would be the perpetual mother superior of the convent, but that she would rule over the people of Quito and all of Ecuador. That was his symbolic way of saying, you, please, Blessed Mother, you be the, uh, the queen to rule over this country. So, but in the other arm, Our Lady is holding the Christ child. And the figure of the Christ child does look quite a bit different in quality and doesn't have the radiance of the statue. And the account is that during one of the revolutionary periods in Ecuador, when there was a lot of revolutionary ferment there and hatred for the church, that the sisters were so afraid the convent was going to be attacked that one of the nuns actually took the figure of the infant away from the statue and hid it in one of the walls. And shortly thereafter, she died. And no one knew where she had hidden it. I mean, maybe the idea was that she alone would keep the secret so that they couldn't get it out of her, you know. But she passed away, and to this day, they've never found it. Um, so they made another... Um, it's a figure of the infant and put it in her lady's arms, but it, you can see the difference. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable difference. Uh, but again, the prophecy, uh, there's prophecy that that figure, the original figure of the infant will be found. When? We don't know. But, um, you know, maybe that's a prophecy, uh, that's another prophecy that hasn't yet been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But it will be discovered how and when we don't know. It'll be interesting to to find what it is discovered and to to finally see that <clears throat> representation of our Lord and to have that infant, that figure placed back in the arms of the statue yeah. of Our Lady. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that'll be a great day, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Absolutely. Poss possibly coinciding with the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, what what does uh, all this mean for traditional Catholics? How should we view this? Um, should we should we be praying to Our Lady of Good Success? And do you think that she could be any any kind of this devotion could be any kind of key to the uh, the problem of our times? Uh, yes, I do think it has everything to do with the situation in our times, and I think Our Lady appeared there to um, reassure us, but also to well, she she has to encourage us 
enlighten us, inspire us, all of those things, right? Well, this is the work of the Holy Ghost. And as the Holy Ghost came upon our lady and overshadowed her in conceiving the Christ child, so uh, this is what Our Lady wants to do for us. I mean, she wants to be, as it were, a conduit of the Holy Ghost to us. And um, another interesting, curious thing, as they say, you know, I mentioned uh, February 2nd, 1594, February 2nd, 1634. Uh, well, January 16th, 1611, as I, as I recall, was when the statue actually did arrive into the church. And I think that's, that's the date, uh, January 16th, when Mother Mariana died, died to, to, to that very day mm -hmm. uh, that she died later on, after the last apparition in uh, 1634. <clears throat> so kind of an interesting convergence there. But, uh, you know, when Our Lady talks about the, the great... Uh, uh, battle that's going to come for the church and how the church is going to be beset from every side, from within and from without, and basically the apost I mean, what she's describing really is great apostasy. Uh, she's describing the corruption of the, the, the clergy of the church, and they will not only not be agents of our Lord and for the sanctity of souls and for the saving of souls, but they'll be agents of corruption. I mean, actually become like agents of Satan working within the church to corrupt souls. Um, so what she's describing here is, is really very startling. And it should also be um, very reassuring to us that God knows that this is happening and he has promised us that... Uh, this will all end well. I mean, there will be many, many souls will be in heaven and in very high places in heaven because they will have been faithful here on earth. In other words, God is saying, yes, these evils are coming because of sin, but my grace will be with you. My grace will be with you. Like you said to St. Paul, when St. Paul said, Lord, deliver me from this, St. Paul gave the catalog of all the things he had to endure. And then he says, in a sense, as if that weren't enough, <laughs> you know, then God sent an, an angel, an angel of Satan came to buffet me, he said. And three times I asked God to take it away, but God said, no, my grace is enough for you because strength is made perfect in weakness. Meaning the sense that your weakness gives room for my strength to work through you and in you. And so I think that's what our Lord is going to be saying to the people of our time. And I think he said that essentially through the apparitions of Our Lady of Quito. You know, you're going to be reduced to this, but my strength will be with you. And you will, you will triumph. And it will be clear that it, it will be my triumph through you. Right? It will be my triumph for, it will be my triumph for you. Um, we're very blessed to have uh, named uh, our church and school and dedicated that to Our Lady's Immaculate Conception because I feel a real affinity here with the uh, the apparitions. You know, the, the sisters there long before the definition dedicating themselves, their convent to the Immaculate Conception. And uh, so I, I just find a, a bond there with them and a de that dedication. Um, but, um, you know, Tom, one of the things that Our Lady said to Mother Mariana was that the, the sacraments would be attacked, that the, the attack on the church would come especially most fiercely in the attack on the sacraments, right? right. It's the very lifeblood of the church, okay? Literally in the, in the Holy Eucharist, right? And she singled out the attacks on marriage and the priesthood. Uh, she especially emphasized the attacks on the sanctity of marriage, matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony. And we see this, the, the, the annulment uh, pandemic going on, right? And uh, we see this also in the adulteration of the sacrament of holy orders, the very first sacrament the modernists succeeded in changing, right? And it's in its essence, and its uh, the, the the ritual, the rite that is followed, um, and uh, and now uh, attacking the very concept of the priesthood, which is basically really when you attack the concept of the priesthood, you attack the very concept of Christ, 
our understanding of who Christ is as the high priest. Um, the, when you attack the identity of the priest, the priest, you're attacking the identity of the priest, the high priest, Christ himself. And that's really why they, why they wanted to destroy the whole concept of priesthood, because if you destroy that, you destroy the very concept of a savior, a mediator between God and man, a redeemer. You destroyed the whole concept. Uh, the whole mission of Christ on earth, right? You've destroyed that, and that's exactly what they want to do. Voltaire said it very simply back in the 1600 or so, that uh, his goal was to erase the very memory of Christ from the minds of men. So that he wouldn't even be a memory. Interestingly enough, he said that if we allow even the memory of Jesus Christ to remain, again, the church will rise from the dead. Now that's faith. That man had faith to think that even the memory of Christ would enable, uh, would enable the church to rise from the dead. But he made it very clear. His purpose was écraser l'infant, to erase, to completely wipe out the wretched thing, meaning the church. He wanted to annihilate the church. And he, the only way to do that was to annihilate the memory of Christ. So, um, yes, I think what's going on today has everything to do with this. And on top of that, you know, we have uh, a, a very, very interesting book uh, on, the, on the Apocalypse. Okay, this is a commentary on the, well, what they now call the Book of Revelation after the Apocalypse. But, I mean, let's face it, every book of the Bible is a book of Revelation, right? So uh, that's kind of the Protestant name given to the book of Revelation. The church simply refers to it by its Greek term, the Apocalypse, okay? The revelation of hidden things, or the hidden things of God, meaning the future. And uh, I would recommend this book to not only anyone, I would recommend it to everyone. <laughs> Reverend Herman Bernard Kramer, The Book of Destiny, you can see that, and it is readily available. You'd be surprised um, about who's, who's carrying this book right now. And, uh, and uh, Father Kramer here um, actually was born just uh, nine years after uh, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia Moreno died as a martyr. He was born right here in Petersburg, Iowa. And he devoted his life, which was a life uh, racked by some serious illnesses, to studying the book of the Apocalypse. And this, the book of destiny, is the result of his labors to understand and tie together the references throughout the scriptures to enable us to understand the significance of what we read in the book of the Apocalypse. And it is astounding how it coincides in my, how it coincides with what Our Lady revealed at Quito. Really? Her revelations are, uh, I think, um, echoed to say the least, echoed in in the book of the uh, the book of Destiny, uh, meaning the commentary on the book of the Apocalypse. Now there are quite a number of commentaries <clears throat> on the book of the Apocalypse. Okay, over the centuries, you would expect that, right? right? Um, but I don't know of any other book that brings them all together in one volume um, to really tie them together. And Father Kramer actually goes through the reading. It's very dense because he's covering a lot of ground in 500-something pages. What is it? Uh, uh, well, yeah, just about 500 pages. And he... Uh, he talks about theories about what this would mean and what that would mean, but he explains why those theories are not true. And I must say, his explanations are very down-to-earth and very common sense, so that I have yet to find an explanation that he gives that doesn't make perfect sense. And then he explains what he believes it does say, what it means, and uh, he gives us a very good background as to why. And I'm telling you, I mean, at least I'm very impressed by his his reasoning, uh, his thoughtfulness, uh, he must have put not only an enormous amount of research into this, he must have put an enormous amount of prayer and sacrifice into treating this holy text with the reverence that is due. You know, I, I wanted to read to you from the text, but 
everywhere I, it's, it's like one of those things like you dip your toe into the stream and say, oh, this is, this is where we should start. And then, they, you know, you say, oh, no, well, that, we should start there because this is so interesting and so important. But then you say, where do you end? You know, you want to keep reading because say, oh, the, like the next paragraph has such something so interesting and so applicable. But um, again, I, I think especially chapters 12, uh, 13, and uh, well, you know, all the way, all the way through beyond that. I mean, that get, takes us about ha halfway through the book to make, make a start on chapter 12. But uh, he really explains a lot there, and I, I don't know, we don't have an enormous amount of time, but I know you have more patience than you have time, and <laughs> I don't know about our readers. <laughs> but if I just may read yes, a absolutely. little bit from this, and the reason I would read this is not to read it for you, <clears throat> uh, because I'm hoping that it will just incite interest to read for yourselves yeah. the whole thing. Because for everything that I'm reading, there's a thousand more things that are really very significant. <clears throat> but um, I won't read this part. Read it yourself. I found it very interesting. The two witnesses. That with the Antichrist, there will come into the world two witnesses. Okay, And these two witnesses will lead the opposition to the Antichrist. Many of our viewers are aware of this. Elias, the prophet, and Henoch, the patriarch, were taken by God in similar fashion. And they are being held by God somewhere for a future moment. I mean, uh, Scripture actually tells us about this. Yes. And the fathers of the church tell us that these two witnesses spoken of in the book of the Apocalypse are Elias and Henoch, having been sent into the world in order to leave the op lead the opposition to the Antichrist. And that they actually will be res responsible for the conversion of the Jews to Christ. That uh, many of the Jews will welcome the Antichrist as their new Messiah. But uh, <laughs> the events that follow... The persecution that follows and the leadership of these two witnesses, Elias and Enoch, will actually convince many, many of the Jewish people to leave the service of the Antichrist, cross over into the service of God, of Christ himself, and actually be the, the, the bastion of resistance against the Antichrist. Uh, many of them, you know, paying the price of their lives, but heroically, uh, you know, standing up for the rights of our Lord Jesus Christ, who were at, not long before great enemies to the cross of Christ. Very interesting thing. But it, it coincides also with the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 7, where we read uh, about God commanding the angels not to strike the earth until, until uh, the, the, those were signed, who were meant to be signed by God. Uh, with the sign of the, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ on their foreheads. And uh, they are enumerated as 144,000 who are signed, 12,000 for the tri each of the tribes of Israel, except the tribe of Dan alone is not mentioned, interestingly enough. But of the other tribes of Israel, descendants from I Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, uh, 12,000 are signed, as it were, one for each of the apostles. One, uh, one, one tribe, 12,000 for each of the, one of the apostles called. And um, now there are those who want to say that, well, you see, that means there are 144,000 who are going to be saved, and that's not true. Because you keep reading in Apocalypse chapter 7 about the vast multitude from every tribe and nation and tongue and people who are standing before the throne and worshiping in heaven. <clears throat> not 144,000, and not just Jews. But these are descendants of Abraham. These are real Jews who are going to be converted in those days. And so, uh, you know, the book of the Apocalypse actually indicates to us, and Father Kramer brings this out very clearly, <clears throat> that the Jews will be converted um, through the activities and the arguments, uh, the leadership of these two witnesses, uh, notably their great prophet, uh, Elias, and their great forebear, Hanok. And um, 
that um, they, this is what I, what I found most interesting, is what Father Kramer indicates, that they're the ones who will actually lead be the leadership of the church sent by God at that time. That they are the ones who actually will be endowed with the authority to lead the faithful at that time. That's very interesting in light of the current situation yeah. of the papacy. Yeah. Right? Now, there are those who may challenge that, but, you know, we're, you're free to read what uh, Father Kramer says here. And what he says here uh, is, is fully imprimatur, fully approved. Uh, with a censor deputatus, uh, J.S. Constantine, a Dominican, and uh, the Bishop of Sioux City, Iowa, Joseph M. Miller, uh, January 26, 1956, gave his imprimatur that there's nothing in this book that contravenes Catholic teaching. Copyright 1955 by Herman Bernard F. Leonard Kramer. Okay, so this is a Catholic publication. Okay, and um, it's very interesting. I, I found it astounding what he said that these are the two men sent from God who will lead the church in that day. And we might say, well, why would this be so? And then you keep reading and you come to some very interesting things. Um, I hope you'll bear with me while I, yes. while I read you some of these things that might actually be a help here. Um, I wonder how far I'll have to read. Well, I'm going to have to read about four or five pages here, if you don't mind. This um, is uh, headed uh, chapter, this is uh, heading the works of the beast, verses five and six. He takes it verse by verse, okay, so he's extremely thorough. This is chapter 13 of the book of the Apocalypse, verses five through eight. And this is where I'm beginning here. Uh, this is actually the chapter, um, the description of the two beasts begins in page 302 of this printing. And the section I'm reading begins on page 312. By the way, this is available on PDF online to archives.org, I think, and another source too, at least one. The works of the beast, verse 5. On the strength of his satanic endowments, Antichrist will open his mouth in blasphemies against God, his creator. The words are those of Daniel, attributed to the, the little horn. That's Apocalypse chapter 7, verse 20. The admiration of his followers, their praises and flatteries. The divine cult organized in his honor will elate his pride to consider himself equal to God and prompt him to utter words of blasphemous daring. Domitian was the living example of how pride will induce a man to assume divine titles. Antichrist can act and speak thus only by divine permission, just as all agencies of Satan can do no more than God allows for the fulfillment of his purposes, that is, God's purposes. <clears throat> this permission refers to verse 2. Quote, and the dragon gave it great power. So in every other text in the Apocalypse, the phrase, it was given unto him, means that no one can do good or evil unless God permits. The permission to con continue his satanic activity will last 42 months. The same time allotted to the two witnesses to work real miracles and preach penance and conversion to God. It also the time during which the great eagle, that's a very interesting reference here in this chapter 13 and elsewhere, the great eagle protects the church against the serpent. So you actually have these two great images of the red dragon and with its diadems, we might say stars and its crown, right? <laughs> and the great eagle, which protects against it. Curious, what? Right? Hippolytus holds two periods of three and a half years each, during the first of which the two witnesses shall preach, work miracles, and convert the world, and at the end of which Antichrist shall overcome them by a war and kill them, and then shall rule supreme for the second period. That interpretation proposes inexplicable difficulties, and it contradicts the text. 
The whole time allotted him in this verse is to do two and forty months. That seems to be the entire time at his disposal to conquer the world and hold his dominion. So in other words, what Hippolytus said, and again, when you talk about Hippolytus, you're talking like 1,700 years ago or more. I mean, he was commenting on this text. So you see that Father Kramer has done his homework here. He says that Hippolytus' interpretation can't be true. He says it's not two periods of three and a half years, it's one. That the Antichrist and the witnesses actually confronting each other <clears throat> during the same time period. And he goes on to verse 6. That was just to, to comment on that one verse, verse 5. In verse 6 he says, He opened his mouth is a stereotyped clause to denote the beginning of a discourse. As the prophets, our Lord, and the apostles opened their mouths to speak the praises and revelations of God. So Antichrist will open his mouth to teach the multitudes his lies and blasphemies. He will not be satisfied with assuming divinity and having himself proclaimed God. He will spread and enforce his blasphemous doctrines everywhere. The imperial edicts of the Caesars and the laws of the communists in Russia and Mexico foreshadow the work of Antichrist. But his work will be more fundamental, more thorough, and more replete with pride and malice. He will jeer and scoff at the divine life of Christ. At his resurrection and ascension, he will ridicule the belief in any other god than himself, indicating by specious reasoning, by the evils that override the world, by the bad management of the world, that a god with the perfections attributed to him, true God, could not exist. And he will dare God to punish him if he exists. His blasphemies against the name of God and the name, the word name here is actually uh, italicized, especially singling out the blasphemies against the very name of God, will equal those against his person. The second commandment must be abolished as necessarily as the first. His followers must honor his name, not that of a God who does not exist. And therefore he will assume divine titles and will make people swear by his name and by his, authority, his divinity. The Roman emperor is typified Antichrist in this. To abolish belief in God and his law, it will be sufficient to trample upon the first three commandments of the Decalogue. Men who openly dishonor the name of God will express their contempt for God himself and for all his laws. The hatred and malice of Satan inspiring Antichrist will reserve its most venomous shafts for the church, and especially for the Holy Eucharist. <coughs> His tabernacle, quote-unquote, is the best translation for skenane, because it fits in a rigid context with, quote, those who dwell in heaven, end quote, which, as most interpreters ad admit, means the church, that is, those who dwell in heaven would be the episcopate, priesthood, and religious orders, and the tabernacle would be the dwelling place of the Lamb. The sacred mystery of the real presence of Christ has thwarted all the malice of Satan, who will inspire his vicar to exert all his efforts against that dwelling and the indwelling divinity there. Now notice he talks about Satan and his vicar, his vicar being the Antichrist. And he says the, the, the Antichrist as the vicar of Satan will exert all his efforts against the dwelling, the, the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the, of the Son of God on earth, the indwelling trinity. The tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven stands for the whole church and all the church holds sacred. The sacraments, the priesthood, and religious life, the Christian family, the infallible dogmas, and the moral law. The whole efforts of Antichrist during those 42 months of his reign will be directed against all that God has planted in the human heart and instituted in the world, because Satan knows it will be his last chance to wreck the work of Christ. If he could drive the Eucharistic Lamb out of the world, he might have the victory. But he cannot do this unless he wipes out the priesthood of Jesus Christ. 
So Antichrist's blasphemies are only the impotent rage of Satan against God and the church. Now, I know I said I was going to read quite a bit, and I'd like to, and, um, but I'm, I'm not going to read this whole thing, okay? Uh, this book is readily, avail readily available. If this is just kind of an enticement to get a hold of it and read the rest of it, then so be it. That's good. But <clears throat> I do want to read this bit, uh, verse 11. Okay, again, from the same uh, chapter 13. Because it has to do very much with what we're, we're facing right now. In the vision of the seer, uh, in the vision of the seer, he's talking about the seer. He's talking about John the Apostle, who's receiving this, uh, the, the revelations of the apocalypse. <clears throat> in the vision of the seer now appears a second beast rising out of the earth having two horns like a lamb, but speaking like a dragon. This beast is the prophet of Antichrist. So the Antichrist will have a prophet, in a sense very much like our Lord had John the Baptist, right? Our Lord referred to John the Baptist as a prophet and more than a prophet, right? The Antichrist will have his prophet too, who will appear as a second beast. Uh, it, in other places, he is called the quote, false prophet. Antichrist will have a forerunner or prophet who will prepare the way for him. It will undoubtedly be someone who has done great work of evil in the world so as to be especially fitted for the position. Many may have developed so evil a character as to be fit for such a job, but this one may be at the head of a strong world power. Satan will not know long beforehand the time of these events, <laughs> as he will not know when he shall be cast out of the church. So choosing the false prophet will be the work of the Antichrist after the Antichrist himself, after he has made his own pact with Satan. Now, that's a very important statement here. He says this, Satan will not know long beforehand the time of these events. And that's important for us to know because Satan cannot actually foresee the future. He can kind of guesstimate with a satanic intelligence, but he doesn't see as God sees, you know? And he can't predict the working of grace. So he says, actually, <clears throat> it will be the work of the Antichrist, his vicar, who will personally choose his forerunner. Um, so choosing the false prophet will be the work of the Antichrist himself after he has made his own pact with Satan. Thus, this prophet may reestablish the pagan Roman Empire and build the great harlot Babylon. He comes out of the earth, which is the term for the Gentile nations from which he springs. He is briefly described, if I may aside here a little bit too, he mentions elsewhere that this false prophet um, <clears throat> uh, will reestablish paganism. <clears throat> and that is an explanation of the beast, the, the, the dragon, the beast that was, that was struck unto death but survived and re revived mm -hmm. and resurrected. Pagan, the paganism of the Roman Empire uh, appeared to be struck to death by Christianity, but the world will marvel at its resurrection. And this is the, the resurrection that the false prophet and the one for whom he's the vicar, the, the Antichrist, will give the resurrection of paganism, the world, he says. So, curious in light of recent events. Um, anyway, um, this false prophet is briefly described. He has two horns. Antichrist has ten. These two horns might stand for two kings subject to him if the phrase, like a lamb, were not added. That gives the horns a different significance. He may italics, have two world powers subject to himself, but the added phrase, 
like a lamb, seems to intimate that he is an apostate bishop or cardinal, or he resembles one. The church, having fled from Rome after the murder of the pope, leaves the papal chair vacant. This false prophet, possibly at the behest of Antichrist, usurps the papal supremacy and proposes himself as the emperor of Rome. His assumed spiritual authority and supremacy over the church would make him resemble the bishop of Rome. And his temporal regency over the re-established empire would make him emperor of Rome. He would be Pontifex Maximus, a title of pagan Roman emperors, having supreme spiritual and temporal authority. Assuming authority without possessing it makes him the false prophet. Does this allude to what our Lord said? Though he poses as a lamb, a Christian, his doctrines betray him, for he preaches the doctrines of the dragon, his principles and dogmas to be accepted, his moral and civil law will be of diabolical inspiration. It may be com communism or plain idolatrous paganism. It will compromise emperor worship, I'm sorry, it will comprise emperor worship and devil worship coupled with persecution of the true believers. They will know him at once as an imposter and will not be misled. He will be in league with the anti-Christian world powers and adopt their principles of government and civil law. As spiritual head of his empire, he may declare it treason against the state to accept Christianity or the moral law of God. He will evidently do in his own empire what Antichrist will do in his who, as Daniel writes, shall think himself able to change times and laws. Now, this is just the beginning of his treatment about this, this false prophet. He goes on and explains quite a bit about him. But it's, I think it's very fascinating because when he talks about his principles and dogmas to be accepted, his moral law, it may be communism or plain idolatrous paganism. And you see, you see Francis talking about communists are true Christians. Yeah. They understand the gospel. Yeah. And his worship of the pagan idols, even right there in, in, under the canopy of, of Bald you know, the Baldacchino over the high altar of St. Peter's, and setting these idols up uh, at, his, at his seances in Rome, right? I mean, how blatant could you get? Now, there are those who, if you or I were to say these things, they would say, well, you're, you're just, you know, being these radical, conspiratorial, traditional Catholics, you know, who question these things you, you must not question. But Father Kramer has written this uh, under the seal of an imprimatur long ago when Catholic bishops acted and thought like Catholic bishops and actually had the faith. And they saw nothing in this that was controversy, contrary to the faith, to believe this and to say these things. <clears throat> if, if you thought it was interesting to hear what he had to say here, basically that's one page about the false prophet. Yeah. You know, and, and would like to know what he says next, then you will not be disappointed if you get a copy of this book and start reading it or look it up and start reading, uh, you'll have a hard time stopping. I, I was reading until almost three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, and that was when not uh, even my aged brain gave out, it's when my eyes gave out. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, you start reading this now in the context of what is happening already, what is happening now in the church and in the world, and you realize, my goodness, really, and you, you couple it what, 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 what Our Lady told us at Quito. You realize we have a lot to go on. on. We have a lot to go by. And um, rather than be uh, horrified by modern day events to the point of uh, losing confidence or even despair as some poor souls of weak faith might, 
I mean, we know how this turns out. We know where this leads. Uh, so much of what he writes there is about the triumph of those faithful Catholics who will not succumb and will not be uh, misled by the, uh, you know, the pumps and the, uh, the blandishments of the Antichrist. Quite the contrary, they will hold fast. And, you know, you read that, you read what he says here, and it sounds absolutely glorious. So we have everything to be um, enthused about in a spiritual sense. And uh, in a sense, thankful to God that he has chosen us to be here now at this time. Because he's promised some extraordinary graces to those who love the truth and want to be faithful to him. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. We will see. <laughs> That's one thing's for sure. We will see. Yeah. So anyway, Tom, I'll, I'll uh, leave off with a recommendation uh, that uh, people begin, you know, reading the Book of Destiny. And if you want to go to the parts that I think concern us immediately, I would say chapters 12, 13, 14. Um, you know, in light of all these things, what Jean Guiton, a great friend of Paul VI said, as he stood next to Paul VI right there at the end of Vatican II, when Paul VI was about to promulgate the documents of the council, he said Paul VI turned to him, his good buddy Paul VI, and just commented to him, I'm about to sound the trumpets of the apocalypse. A statement that Jean Guiton himself uh, really uh, was struck by, you know, and years later commenting on it said he, it really struck him that, that Paul VI would tell him, I'm about to sound the trumpets of the apocalypse in proclaiming the documents of Vatican II. And if anybody wants to know who Jean Guiton is, you can look him up, J-E-A-N, first name Jean, G-U-I-T-T-O-N, Guiton, well-known French philosopher of the middle 20th century, uh, observer at Vatican II at Paul VI's personal invitation. Um, he had a lot to say. But anyway, not nearly as much as Father Kramer. <laughs> not nearly as well said either. Yep. So. Well, thank you for all that, Father. It's uh, definitely fascinating, but uh, inspiring and encouraging at the same time. So... Uh... Well, I hope so, Tom. Uh, I think Father Kramer wrote this book precisely to encourage us, not to terrify us or frighten us or discourage us, but quite the contrary, mm -hmm. to enlighten, to encourage, to inspire us. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you, Father. Thank you for all that you do. God bless you. Oh, you're welcome, Tom. Thank you. Yep. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.